Good evening, everyone. Uh, we've been trying to do this for almost a year, uh, and now finally we can do it. And in fact, a presentation like this, a virtual presentation, might turn out to be better than having it at our regular meeting place because I understand that this is going to be recorded. I'd like to give some shout outs here first to uh, to John uh, Stanton down in Florida. You're on tonight, and uh, John knows a lot about this uh, topic. He's done a lot of reading. We've talked a lot about it. He's done a presentation in southern New York. Also, just want to say a word about Joel Kossoff, W3Z uh, Tango from Skinny Atlas. He's a longtime member of the Antique Wireless Association, and uh, he is our, our resident guru in uh, spy radios at the AWA. Uh, and he's had a lot of them, and he's put a lot of me on the air, and he's very widely read in this topic. I don't think he's on tonight. And uh, Tom Barrera, good evening to you. Uh, glad to have you on board. This presentation is sponsored by the Antique Wireless Museum. Um, we've given several talks like this before. And uh, uh, it comes from a double article that uh, uh, Joel Kossoff and I gave, produced at the journal what in 2018-2019, on the spy radio and, of course, the spies who went. So this is a, a much larger thing than, uh, than just a larger presentation than what, what we wrote about. Right at the bottom, you can see the bibliography there. Uh, I'd like for you to uh, just remember that. Just go to antiquewireless.org and then uh, uh, go to the little uh, uh, magnifying glass and look up the word bibliography and it will come up. Uh, bibliography of several pages uh, on this topic. I warn you, if you start reading all of this, uh, you will get uh, what I call PTSD uh, light. Uh, it will start to weigh on you because uh, the the events that took place during the Second World War were so horrendous. And as a reminder, tomorrow is the 75th anniversary of the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. So let's start now. Um, at the beginning of the war, we have two, for what we're talking about, two big personalities. But in fact, there were more personalities than that. There was Stalin, there was Churchill, and a lot of subaltern uh, uh, people, uh, and we know that we, we know their names pretty well. Uh, but I'd like to say a few things about this. Churchill, in fact, uh, his maternal grandparents were married in the, Presbyter the Western Presbyterian Church in Palmyra, New York, just east of us, uh, married in 1845. That church played a big role on the Underground Railroad, and if you'd like to go sometime and have a tour there, you would learn a lot. A lot of uh, uh, escaped uh, people who, who had been imprisoned for slavery and whatnot came up through the north, and they came through there. Their daughter, uh, Jenny Jerome, a lady became uh, Lady Randolph Churchill, the uh, mother of, of, uh, of our Churchill we know. Leonard, the father, was a co-founder of the Rochester Daily American, which became the Democrat and Chronicle. So there's a very close relationship. Uh, I've heard people say that he was once here in Rochester, and I've heard other people say, no, he wasn't. Uh, Winston was in the Second Boer War in South Africa, and he was actually imprisoned uh, and uh, captured in prison, and he escaped. That was in 1900. He learned a lot from that. He became a scrappy guy. He tried to become a member of parliament right after that. It didn't work, but in 1924, he did. And he also then became the chancellor of the Exchequer. He had a long experience. Uh, experiences in government. Uh, he had always been against German rearmament after World War I, and he was a conservative. Now, let's uh, talk about the beginning of the war. It's really important to understand this, how the SOE, the, 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 secret, uh, uh, the secret actions into, into Europe uh, happened. September 1, 1939, was the invasion of Germany into Poland, and Britain declared war. But uh, not until around May 20th of 1941, uh, that is to say uh, maybe eight months or so, uh, there was really no war. There was war. People were dying by the hundreds of thousands in Poland and east uh, uh, from the, uh, the, the German uh, invasion there. But nothing was happening in really in the West. So it was called the phony war. The phony war. Um, but then around May 20th, the, you have the invasion of Belgium, Netherlands, and finally France. And that is when things became very serious. There was a BEF, a British expeditionary force of hundreds of thousands of men, uh, British soldiers in the uh, low countries. 
And of course, we all know about the Dunkirk um, uh, activity where uh, an Operation Dynamo, where they evacuated 336,000 men uh, on many destroyers were sunk, uh, but 850 private boats went over. They were given um, they were given uh, petrol to to do that, and they many of them would go back and forth and back and forth. Uh, we've seen that recent movie called Dunkirk. Uh, just a little uh, aside here, as it turns out, uh, my father-in-law, um, who passed away many many years ago, uh, had um, was from Scotland and uh, had lied about his age and uh, found himself at Dunkirk. He never really talked about it. But uh, when all of them got off, got all the 336,000, including uh, many thousands of French soldiers, uh, all these soldiers were dispersed all over the British Isles because they did not know if the Germans would attack and where they would attack and how they would attack. So he found himself up country in Scotland. And by the way, that's where he met his future wife, and uh, and uh, my wife was born in Scotland. I was born here, but uh, but they came from Scotland. He was also uh, in uh, after the, uh, the D-Day. He was also in a uh, artillery unit uh, in northern France. So uh, we have a kind of a close relationship in this family with it. Uncles were uh, were navigators uh, uh, flying to uh, bombing raids into. Um, into Norway, and uh, one uncle by marriage is 97 now and in relatively good health, uh, was the president of Grampian Radio Television in Scotland for 25 years or so, still living today in Aberdeen, and uh, he, uh, uh, he was a tank commander as a young man in Burma at the end of the war. So I think a lot of families can tell stories like this. So the, uh, the army was dispersed across the British Isles. Winston replaces Neville Chamberlain as the prime minister, but people did not really trust him and he had to uh, to win their trust, both the people themselves as well as in the new war cabinet. If you'd like to read a very good book, it's a very thick one. It's The Last Lion, The Last Lion, and you'll find that on the bibliography. It's almost a day by day blow description of what Churchill did. Then you have the capitulation of the French uh, government uh, to the invading Germans. And then you have on the 17th of June, uh, a, a, a secret quick flight from Bordeaux, which is uh, down on the coast of France, uh, a flight bringing um, de Gaulle uh, into London. He had been a military at the Military Academy Saint-Cyr, Saint-Cyr, C-Y-R, the premier military academy in 1912. He'd been wounded uh, in World War One, a prisoner of war at, at Verdun, and uh, he he advocated mechanized divisions. He became a brigadier general, and always for his whole life said that that's what his title was, brigadier general. Uh, so he arrived on the 17th of June at 3 p.m., and Churchill was there to meet him at the airport. In that on that afternoon, the old General Pétain, P-E-T-A-I-N, who had been the famous general of World War One in France said the fighting must end. And uh, that will bring us to our next uh, slide in a second. But immediately when, when de Gaulle landed, Churchill gave him the opportunity to speak on uh, the BBC. And on that evening, uh, the, we had two broadcasts, uh, the same evening, June 18th actually. Uh, one was to Britain and one was to France. Uh, Churchill made his statement, this is our finest hour. And in De Gaulle, he had his call, his appel of the 18th of June to the citizens. So you have Pétain, who is in the uh, in the um, southern uh, southern France, and he is given kind of a little uh, uh, the Vichy zone, the free zone, as though it were a free area. And but De Gaulle said, no, we're going to have, we're going to be, it's totally occupied. And so Pétain and De Gaulle were at loggerheads with each other. Just a quick uh, quick note here. Churchill always stood up with, for, for de Gaulle, always supported de Gaulle. The Americans supported the free zone at the beginning uh, under Pétain. Uh, and and uh, Roosevelt did not like uh, uh, de Gaulle at all. So we had these problems all the way through the war, all the way through the war. 
So you have here uh, on the bottom left, you have travail, patrie, famille, work, country, family. Um, Pétain wanted to focus on that and not on the loss of half of France. You see down there on the bottom right, the green area, uh, that's an area that Italy was given as an occupation area. And some of our family actually have lived and still live uh, just south of Geneva. You will see Geneva and Switzerland there, the white area, just, just south of the A in Savoy is where the mountains begin on the east. And so the Italians were down there, kind of lackluster. I think that the, that the occupying Italians weren't that uh, interested in occupying the area, but that's another story. The resistance begins actually for the, the British in Norway. Uh, they know they have to save the country and, and protect the iron ore mines and whatnot there, but they do a bad job of it. They had used parasets, uh, uh, gave, gave their, their, their military people parasets. Who were, these people were in, were in, uh, in uniform. They used regen receivers, and as you well know, regen receivers uh, transmit a signal out, out the antenna so they could be easily, easily found. Uh, it all started with the SIS, or which was MI6, which was the ex external, uh, not the internal, which was MI5, but the MI6 was for international uh, information and, and uh, a security service. They were dropped by parachute, so they're called you know, the parasets. It was disc discontinued because of the constant telltale regenerative signal. By the way, the Sussex, the Operation Sussex in 1940, early beginning 44, which is a totally different uh, uh, topic uh, than tonight's topic. They used parasets as well. Uh, they were groups of of uh, two men, sometimes three, going in ahead of D-Day, and they used parasets. I don't know why. So the linchpin was the B-2, and it had uh, various uh, iterations after that. And later on, when the OSS, the American OSS, came in, they had more developed radios. But as it turns out, uh, the British learned that uh, that this radio, this B2 spy radio, was rather good. Now, you're wondering, you know, why am I talking about B2 spy radio to begin with anyway? Well, the Antique Wireless Museum, Museum op owns one, and we were given that by a, a, a semi-aristocrat who gave it to us in the 80s. And uh, we think that it is one of the early ones that was built and was never uh, was never sent into 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 action into the field it's still in its in its suitcase and it's quite heavy it's almost 40 pounds uh the book by mrd foot uh is a larger than life book i've got it sitting right here to my right um several hundred pages uh, published in 1966 as a response to the brouhaha that had was uh, was brewing in uh, in parliament since 1958 Many of, uh, of stories were being told by the about the SOE, which we're going to talk about tonight, and about the secret operatives uh, abroad. A women, of course, and that raised a lot of eyebrows. The reasons, one reason why uh, Foot, a professor from from Oxford, why he uh, was given the green light to write this book, and he did a very good job doing it with a not very not a lot of information, except only the stuff that had not been burned in two fires. Uh, wondering, wondering why those two fires happened. They were afraid that the Soviets uh, in, in, during the Cold War were uh, were saying that they were the ones who did all the work. They were the ones who sent in all the operatives, etc. And so uh, to counteract uh, the Soviets, uh, this book was written, but also to counteract is something that is near and dear to Americans' hearts, and that's called Hollywood. Uh, uh, Hollywood was uh, had been put was putting out all kinds of movies. Um, uh, to the effect that it was really the Americans who who won the war totally, uh, but in fact the uh, uh, Americans, when they went in, found out that the British knew a whole lot more about what they were doing than anybody thought. I would suggest you try to get this book. It's hard to get now, but he wrote another book later on that has almost the same title. But the earliest one is the SOE in France. There it is. It's the uh, B2 uh, Type 3 Mark II. Uh, you can get all discombobulated with this. If you would like to see all, most all of the radios that were produced on all different sides of the conflict in World War II, go to the bibliography, uh, online bibliography at the AWA Museum website, 
and uh, find the book that has uh, all of those. It's just an amazing book. It's in four volumes, actually. I got my copy, not my copy, but I got to see it and look at all four copies through interlibrary loan. As a professor, I was able to do that. It came out of, I think, Alberta, but um, University of Alberta. Uh, but uh, it's a fantastic book, and it has wonderful photos of all the radios and radio types. Here it is. This is our radio. Uh, you'll see up there to almost uh, right center at the top, uh, the crystal. That's not the real crystal. I put that in there for the photo, but that's where it goes. Uh, the radio is, has uh, four elements. The top center is the, uh, is the transmitter. Uh, the bottom center is the receiver. The right-hand side is the power supply. The left-hand side is a box with all of the paraphernalia and the different coils and whatnot. You can see on the right-hand side power supply where they have uh, plugs, those black plugs, which can be turned all different ways, making this, making uh, the power supply, wherever they're getting the power, possible almost from any power source, AC or DC. It was a very good receiver, and uh, the transmitter would put out about 20 watts uh, and did a very good job. It has Pi Network in it. Uh, this is on CryptoMuseum.com. Anybody who's worked in this has has taken a look at that website. It's just chock-a-block full of information. And you can go on the website and see this very picture right here, and it will tell you a whole lot more about it. I took the radio apart and uh, into its pieces just to show you. Uh, you have here the anode tuning and then the aerial tuning. Uh, it's kind of reversed from the way we have radios today. The anode would be the, the plate tuning, and then the antenna tuning would be uh, to the right of that. You would have a wave band there that would that would move back and forth uh, in order to, to tune it much better. Your crystal goes up to the top there. And your grid tuning is, of course, the top left of that small panel on the right. Uh, here's what it looks like underneath. All of the uh, connections were made and double checked and then covered with a something like a, a red, like a red beeswax. And this was among other among other reasons, probably uh, to discourage any uh, any uh, wireless operator in the field from tinkering around with it. Very few people did. Very few of these radios, it seems, broke or went went bad uh, with normal operation. Except many were, of course, destroyed when they were dropped out of airplanes and parachutes didn't open, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Joel Kosov says that uh, he thinks he could make this radio uh, work in a jiffy. We haven't tried it yet. This is the receiver chassis. You can see how it's built a little bit different, and the tubes are loctal tubes. So the, the loctal tubes had just uh, been produced in the United States. I think RCA did it. Uh, someone can correct me on that. So it's, uh, it's rather simple, but it did a very good job. Now, if you ever find one of these one of these uh, uh, keys, hawk your hawk your best car for it because this looks like a very low class key but they're extremely rare, and they are the real McCoy. This is the key that was sent along with the radio into the field. Matter of fact, you'll be able to see one here in just a second. This is uh, the same radio, not the same radio, but the same model in the Museum of the Order of Liberation at the uh, National Hotel of Invalides. It's so the soldier's home at the Musée de l'Armée in Paris, in Paris. Uh, this is where Napoleon is buried. Uh, any of you, and I'm, I'm sure one or two of you at least listening tonight, have been there and seen that. It's a gigantic museum of military history, beginning uh, with the Merovingian Empire uh, in the 5th century, 6th uh, century, coming, coming all the way up to the present. And so in that museum, where you go through the very long, long hallways, you see this. But then there is another part over on another great wing of the museum, and that is the one uh, honoring uh, the, the, resist the French resistance uh, in World War II. And they have, therefore, they have several of these in that same museum. This comes from the cover of the, 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 uh, uh, the left-hand uh, section of the radio, and you can see uh, this is our radio, the museum. It's, it has already been pre-tuned, probably to 50 ohms, or maybe to an antenna. I don't know, maybe I have tried this, maybe to uh, uh, the actual antenna that was used, an 18 meter long antenna, probably strung up uh, outside of the factory uh, to see 
uh, to make it as close as what a an agent and a wireless operator would uh, would uh, would see when they were in the field. This is, this is the thing that really is quite interesting. Uh, these two pictures come from the the booklet that is available, by the way, on this radio. You can get copies of it. Uh, the originals are hard to come by. Uh, let's start at the bottom picture first. It was thought at, right at the very beginning that the earliest uh, uses of the spy radio would be in Paris. If you look at a map, Paris is not very far, really, from uh, from London. And sometimes it would not be the right skip. <laughs> we all know that. If you have a if you're on a daily net, you can copy some people, and others you cannot copy. Uh, maybe Chicago comes in, but uh, but uh, uh, Peoria doesn't. Notice how they would show that you could actually string the antenna up on the ceiling and use the light cord for the power and then either have the uh, the counterpoise on the ground under the carpet. <laughs> Probably you should put it under the carpet or you would hook it to the heat register. Alternatively, people would, uh, and many of them did down in southern France and whatnot, would put the antennas uh, out into a tree. But, and I'm not going to go into this any further, but you can imagine, and the reason is, is there's very little information about this. Nobody, nobody wrote anything. Everything was secret. How did they put antennas in trees to hide them? One person put a tree, put antenna in ivy, like a helix, a helical antenna, right up a, uh, the trunk of a tree uh, to hide it in ivy. Transmitter receiver power supply specs are here. We'll spend a lot of time here, but uh, you can come back to the website and take a look at it. And actually online, you can find exactly the same information. But it does go transmitters from three to 16 megs, and it works on a fundamental and then the second harmonic uh, for the higher frequencies. And they always told the, the operators, you must have an 18 meter wire, long wire to have at least one current node so that you could uh, tune, tune it up. In general, they would uh, have their uh, random wire and head it toward London. I say London, but it was not really received in London. It was received at uh, special receiving sites up country. We'll talk about that later. Then they would put the ground wire underneath along the grass or whatnot underneath to get a better signal in the direction of London. As I said, the power supply was uh, could be almost anything. They had 27 watts receive and 57 watts on transmit. Now, uh, I'll just say this because I don't see it anywhere else. How would they, how would they, uh, uh, how would, how would the, the, the enemy, uh, the Germans uh, find these, find these, these wireless operators, these, these P, they call them pianists. How would they find these pianists? Well, one way of many ways is that if you had a bad, a bad current in a house, uh, Anybody living in an apartment house, with their, their lights would dim uh, to the tune of the of the signal, uh, the CW signal. Other another problem was that the code key itself, the hand key itself, made noise. The people could hear it through the wall. So uh, these people really had a had a real challenge. Who were the wireless operators? Um, so build they had to build agents tools, not just this radio. This is a mansion up north of, of London. It's called the Frith Mansion, and it, it had been called the Frith Mansion, owned by a family. When the war started, British military, the government, moved in all across the nation, not just in London, not just around London, not just around Cambridge or, or, or Oxford, Oxford being uh, uh, northwest, Cambridge being north-northeast. They did this even up in, uh, in in Scotland. They would go in and say, this this building is uh, in requisition by the military for the duration of the conflict. And the family would have to move out. This family was told to get out. Uh, they weren't there at the time. Only the servants were there, but they had to pack up. And within the afternoon, they had to be gone. This was called Station X. All places that the that the military used, even not just the SOE, but but all places had numbers. They were not ever called the Frith anymore, uh, or the Wellwyn. They were not called that anymore. They were called Station X, Station 53A, Station 53B. Radio and many other SOE items were, were, were built, and they were designed and created here at the Frith. Some inventions served as models for Ian Fleming's James Bond gadgets. John Brown was the man who designed 
the main designer of the B2 radio. He also designed what's called the biscuit, which was a receiver, a very small radio that could actually fit into a British biscuit tin and, uh, and be hidden that way. Also created the Frith uh, was the hand generator, which was a bicycle hand generator for jet sets. That would be for units that went in British, French, and American uh, threesomes would go in right after D-Day to uh, mix it up with the German units, uh, uh, the Nazi units south of Paris, trying to make it up to uh, up to uh, uh, Normandy. Uh, they did the well bike that you'll see in a moment. The Wellman, one man sub, basically it didn't work. Uh, the well rod, bolt action suppressed long pistol, that worked. Then they had the time pencil. It was a time pencil number ten. It was a delay. A delay pencil and it worked they, they made they made these by the thousands because uh, they would stick these into the plastic explosives and blow up a f factory or blow up a, uh, a locomotive and whatnot they also made landmines to look like the dung of cows camels and elephants uh, there are no elephants uh, in uh, uh, camels in in france or 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 the netherlands or <laughs> they were in southeast asia so finally, by the end of the war, the, all these uh, items were used all the way across the military theater. Uh, MI9, by the way, uh, was it re was called re the Resistant Network, and uh, that was the the entity and the military entity in London that uh, developed resistance networks for escaping pilots and whatnot uh, to go to over the Pyrenees into Spain, uh, down to Gibraltar, or out through Lisbon, Portugal. Christopher Hutton. Uh, was also made many many escape aids uh, for for them. Today, this site is owned by Smith uh, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, the pharmaceutical company. So these many of these buildings did not did not really go back to the families. They were the families got remunerated, but they didn't go back to the families. Here is a factory, and if you look closely, you will see that the transmitter is up there. Do you, if you look closely, do you see the transmitter section? With, you know, with the the anode and the antenna dials at the bottom left, they're building the transmitter here at this point. This is at Wembley, which is just north of a north part of London, at Station 7A. It was, by the way, hit by a flying bomb, a V1 rocket, in 1944. If you go to the museum there in in France, um, in Paris, you'll see many things like this one. This was another invention, the S phone, radio telephone. The transmitter part had already been developed. It was a simple radar used in the airplane, but this was had to be developed totally new. And uh, it was put on, strapped on by uh, an agent in the field who would be able to talk to the pilot coming in at night and it could not be heard by the enemy at all. It was not that widely used, but it certainly was very important. So where was did all this happen? Uh, this all happened uh, with this group called the SOE. And it did, and it had names. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Uh, Special Operations Executive. No one knew what that meant, and that was exactly what the uh, what, what the intent was. The building did not look like this during the 40s. It was nondescript. By the end of the war, this entire block was occupied by the offices of the SOE. Now Baker Street, you'll remember that. That's the Baker Street of. Uh, of Sherlock Holmes. In fact, it's up the street by about six or seven blocks, and almost no one comes to see this building. But you'll find people, this really happened, <laughs> but you'll find uh, lines of people out in front of the so called Sherlock Holmes, what, what is it, 221 or something like that, B Baker Street, as though it really existed. Uh, tourists really want to see that. Well, it's called the Special Operations Executive. And uh, or the inter-service research, inter-services, excuse me, inter-services, sometimes inter-service research bureau. What did that mean? It was a, they were all cover names. On the inside, they called it the racket. Other people called it uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, in uh, alluding to uh, uh, to story of the uh, the boys in Baker Street, uh, they, and and even uh, on the Oliver Twist stories as well. In the Rockefeller Building. Before the beginning of the America's entry into the war, we had what's called the British Security Coordination, BSC. This was not the SOE, but it was larger than life, but nobody knew it existed. It was run by a, an industrialist, a Canadian, William 
uh, Bill Stevenson, who had been a World War I pilot and had not shot down, but driven the, the Red Baron's own brother, also a pilot, uh, into the ground, and that uh, that brother never flew again. He was he was quite a man, and he became very wealthy, and he had his hand in a lot of things. He also had his hand in in security and uh, intelligence, and he realized that intelligence was so important. So Churchill sent him to America because they did not know if Britain would fall. They did not know if the Blitz on London would and and, and an invasion of of London, an uh, invasion of England would take place of the British Isles would take place. So they sent Bill Stevenson there. Now take a look at the book called A Man Called Intrepid. He was called Intrepid by Churchill. Uh, You're Intrepid. So that was his code name. The book is by William Stevenson. Notice the difference. William Stevenson is the writer, a very well-known, famous writer. And in that book, he always calls activities going on out of Rockefeller Center under William Stevenson, uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, and, and this is wrong. This is not. This is not right. He, but I think he does this for a kind of journalistic uh, readership interest, and not because not not for because it's it's correct. They were not the ba- uh, Baker Street Irregulars. The SOE was, and that operated basically out of London. You have many directors of the SOE. It came at the end to be Major General Colin Gubbins. First, Dancy, then Nelson and Nichols was there, and then Hambro, and finally Gubbins took it over for uh, for a good year and a half. Each section of the SOE relating to each country had a had a, had a section head, and the section head for France was Maurice Buckmaster. Uh, he was uh, a, bis- a very uh, a very good businessman and had spent years in France. So he was the director. He was the man uh, where, where the buck stopped uh, and they would send people uh, to success or they would send people to their death. It was not an easy job. Gubbins was from Northwest Scotland. And matter of fact, he kind of looks like my wife's um, maternal uncle who is still kicking and, and, and healthy in Scotland. You can imagine that Gubbins had a very strong Scottish accent he, he was a small guy, but a very tough guy, very quiet. He had learned uh, how to survive in the highlands, the northern highlands. So that was the boot camp area for the first boot camp area for the SOE people. If you did not pan out in the first boot camp, you were washed out. And all those people who either said they didn't want to participate any longer or they were washed out were actually sent to a very nice prison a very nice compound in another place in Scotland uh, to sit out the war. No information about the SOE ever got out to anybody. In fact, uh, the people who went on the SOE, the agents who went, didn't even know who they worked for. They didn't know the name of it. They didn't know the name of any of these people. Vera Atkins was another person who was a kingpin here. She was born in Romania of Jewish descent, in 1940, she was caught in the Netherlands and, and found her way secretly uh, out of the Netherlands and over to England. She started as a simple secretary of the SOE and worked herself up to be an intelligence officer. At the end of the war, she tracked down all the missing agents, particularly the women who had disappeared. She wanted to know how they died, where they died, under what conditions. She was the one who got Rudolf Huss, who was a com- commandant of Auschwitz, to confess. She told him once, she said, uh, you could not have possibly murdered that many people. He said, oh, yes, I did. And then he blurted out the actual number. Foot in his book, calls Atkins the most powerful personality in the SOE. Uh, she was to be feared. She kept her mouth closed. No one knew except for maybe, uh, maybe a Buckmaster. No one knew that she was Jewish. No one knew that she was from Romania. She has spoke English excellently. She would probably have been put in a, uh, a prison camp at the beginning of the war because she was from those areas. So Foote speaks here about, about uh, women in the war. He talks about the thought of a singular nasty death. Fighting enthusiasm can be quite as strong in one sex as in another. There was plenty of field work that women could do uh, for two obvious reasons, obvious instances. They made excellent wireless operators and for far less obtrusive couriers than men. The reason is that by 1942, Hitler was, had made an order to, to, uh, uh, to comb the streets of France and of the other countries 
and to uh, forcefully, if, if necessary, take young men and sometimes young women to Germany to work in the, in the military, the armament industry, uh, basically as slaves. Tens of thousands never came back. And that's what made a, a, a big difference. It was, you might say, a success, but then it was a failure for, for, for Hitler because by forcing all these men to go, tens of thousands of young men across France, both in the occupied zone in the north and the unoccupied zone at the Vichy regime, uh, they went into the hills. They went into the bush. The word for bush was a word from, from Corsica, uh, called Maquis, M-A-Q-U-I-S, Maquis. So these people call themselves the Maquisards. And from those, from that group, from those groups all over France, during the 43 and 44, you had the, the grist of the resistance. Uh, there is this two fantastic books, again, William Stevenson, Spy Mistress, uh, about uh, her, but I think the best book is by Sarah Helm, A Life in Secrets, Vera Atkins and the Missing Agents of World War II. At the end of her life, she was a very closed mouth person. She did not talk. It's not that she didn't want to. She said nothing about anything. She, she was, she understood that to keep herself secure during the war, she just continued that. So now you have another personality at the main offices. And this is the chef de Godage, who is the chief of, of coding. He was hired at 22 years of age. His father was the uh, proprietor of the most famous antiquarian bookstore at 64 Charing Cross uh, Road. And he learned uh, about secret ciphers playing around in the uh, bookstore of his father. He, he, he permits this picture to be printed in his book. He calls himself, this is, this is the author at his most mature. Uh, he's a, one of the funniest guys to read. You'll just laugh your head off when you read his book, Between Silk and Cyanide. You see it there at the bottom. It has nothing to do with love and sex. Uh, it has to do with uh, hiding codes and uh, and uh, taking a cyanide tablet if you uh, don't want to be tortured upon being uh, caught. He trained fannies. They were the young women who worked at Grendon Underwood and at Poundon, stations 53A and B, who both copied on radio and they also deciphered. They also uh, deciphered the signals that were being sent in by the agents. So at one point he had known, uh, he was only 23, 24, when he figured out that most of the agents, SOE agents being sent to the Netherlands were being caught. Their whole cover was blown and they were actually had uh, their waiting party when they parachuted in. The waiting party was Gestapo. And uh, the Gestapo had this, this game called the Funkspiel. And so what they did was they they used these uh, these radios, these B2 spy radios, and sent uh, fake information to uh, to the SOE. And it was it was Leo Marx who figured it out because there were no mistakes were being made. They they had the time to perfectly to uh, use the information that they had taken off of the SOE agents to create these fake messages. So he was asked one day by Colonel Tiltman. Uh, and, uh, he, was, he was asked by Brigadier Nichols, uh, you haven't told anyone, have you? What did you tell Colonel Tiltman about the Dutch situation? Well, Tiltman was the head of the Dutch unit. They did not want this information of this huge failure to get out because there were enemies in the army, there were enemies in the Navy, there were enemies in, in MI6 who really wanted to see the SOE go the way of all defunct organizations. It always had to fight for itself. So he was asked, did you tell him? He said, nothing, sir. I didn't tell him anything. I was instructed not to discuss country sections. And you always obey your instructions? No, sir. But in this instance, I did. There was silence as Kelt met Jew on the frontier of instinct. We then went our separate ways in the building. Leo Marx was washed out at the very beginning. He was not accepted by Bletchley Park. Bletchley Park is a totally different entity. Leslie Park listened to the military, the, the German military, and was trying to decode them. It had nothing to do with the SOE. But later on, they realized how, how, how valuable he was, but he never did go there. So ciphers, encryption, decryption, and breaking of a code, that is to say, listening in on the enemy and gathering intelligence. Well, we're talking apples and oranges here, really. 
Let's talk about the SOE's encryption methods. At first, they had a, what's called a Playfair or Cypher one used since the Crimean War, but people were starting to figure that out. Uh, it was a Charles Wheatstone cipher, by the way, and using bigrams. By 1941-42, they were doing double transposition. You encode it, and then you encode it again. But they were using a poem, like the Playfair cipher. They were using poems. Now, if the enemy could figure out the poem, if it was a famous poem, and use that as a, what we call a crib, they could, in fact, break the code. Uh, so Leo Marx said, well, I'm going to bet them on that. I'm going to write my own poems. So he wrote his own poems. This guy was, was an erudite kid. He must have been really something to work with. Later on, he, he developed, he came up with this idea after the debacle of the Netherlands. He came up with what's called a one-time pad. And you'd have to have a key for that. So you'd have the pad, which is a cipher, and then you have a key that you would use to work that cipher. It was called a worked out key. That, so he called it a walk for short. Uh, the one-time pad was put on silk, so it was pat-down proof. If you had a code in a piece of paper and you were patted down by militia in the French militia in, in, in the southern France in the Vichy area or a, a German officer or someone, a soldier, it could be heard. So he put it on silk. He had a real problem doing that because almost all the silk was going uh, to make parachutes, but he finally was able to do that. So what does it take to break so that's what he did. So let's jump over here and ask in terms of if you're trying to break a code that you don't know at all, what does it take to break it? Well, lateral thinking. And by the way, I don't know what OTB means. Uh, uh, Off-track betting? No, I'm sorry. It's, it's an acronym for something that I've forgotten. You have to image the enemy. Uh, you have to see the enemy. Anyone who is a historian, particularly ancient history, has to do a lot of imaging of what things might have looked like how things might have been, spending a lot of time doing that. Well, if you're in the in the business of decryption, uh, that's what you're going to be doing. You know, have to know you have to know how to count. You have to have a really good memory. Musicality helps. Well, people used to think that being a crossword puzzler was great. Yes, but other people said not really. But guess what? You had to know a lot of world literature. You had to know a lot about culture because you're dealing with an enemy, and you have to know that that enemy's culture. You have to know their literature because a lot of things are happening that way. So let's, let's keep this separate. Bletchley Park is, it intercepts, intercepts codes that it doesn't understand. And that's where, that's where uh, the Enigma machine comes in. The SOE is not breaking codes. The SOE is deciphering its own codes when they come in from the field. But sometimes they could not break their own codes because of atmospheric conditions, the person who copied down the five-letter code, you know, they're, they're, in, they're, they're called in groups, five-letter word groups, uh, maybe they got it wrong. So they would have to have a whole raft of young women, fannies, to break these. And sometimes they would go 5,000 attempts to break one very important message from the field. They would use a crib, uh, a guessing word or a phrase at the beginning or the end of the message. Now, for instance, uh, if you're going to break a code from the enemy, you would say, like at the bottom here, you would listen to the usual Heil Hitler, HH. I mean, sometimes a German would do that. We're only talking about Bletchley Park here. We're not talking about the SOE. Sometimes uh, the enemy would, 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 would be told, you didn't send that message. Well, send it again. Well, that's, that's called a crib. That's a, that's a beautiful crib. And, and, uh, and if the message was long, that was beautiful because that's called depth. You now have a whole lot of information you can use to go back and forth in these five letter codes to see what kind of a pattern you can create. You have the depth of two, that's a different message, but the same transposition key used. In other words, they didn't change the transposition key for the next day. Or anagramming, finding the same word in two different messages. So you'd find the same, not, not five letter, but you'd find something else. When I say five letter word groups, that's not one word, that's parts of a word, or maybe two words. They're all run together. But then you assume also the occasional radio receiving mistakes. We'll talk about that in a minute. Here is a poem or a text code uh, using double transposition. The, co the, the poem is not here, but this is the code used for that. Uh, the first, so you have keys. Double transposition, first keys is went down my, is from a poem, and then uh, Turpin told Tenon. This is from a poem, and you're hoping that the enemy doesn't know what the poem is. 
So you have a particular code on this one. Uh, this was from the and from 1944, uh, and it was copied that uh, that something should be completed today. A march begins tomorrow to cross whatever. Now let's go back to the uh, to the SOE. Uh, this is the one-time pad called the worked out key, uh, and it's on silk. Some of these still exist, by the way, in the museums in in Paris. Agent training at Beaulieu Mansion, uh, right down on the English Channel, very close to the English Channel. This is where they would come for what they were called was called finishing school. The agents would have a six-month training course, and the wireless operators at the end of that would go for three more months to learn wireless uh, were Morse code. A lot of people who were not uh, the wireless trans, uh, wireless people, the pianists, also learned Morse code. They had to, they were told that they had to learn to copy and maybe even send it 25 words per minute with a hand key. That's quite a challenge. Here's another picture of one of the buildings at Beaulieu. Here is one of the classes uh, showing how the airplane this comes in at night, and you have four, sometimes just three, uh, flashlights held by four or three people, and the pilot knows exactly how to land. They will land, go to the end, turn around, come not even come straight back to the point where they landed at, turn the plane around again to be ready to take off. Then they would let out their passengers, take in new passengers, or deliver things. Notice the woman sitting here. Uh, there are many more men in the SOE than women, but they are there for sure. There are so few pictures of this. This is such a highly secretive thing that we don't have very many pictures. Uh, people had to disguise themselves. Here, Peter Folis, the same guy, left and right, the same man. Here's his disguise. For SOE agents, as well as for p downed pilots, they were told a lot of important things. Don't ask for a café noir or a café au lait. There is no such thing as black coffee or milk coffee, it's all black coffee. So you simply say coffee. If you had said that, everybody in the whole cafe or the whole bar would turn and look at you, knowing that you are not one of them. If you're a man and you have a beret, do not take off your beret inside the bar or restaurant. Cycle on the right side of the road, please, not the left side, you Brits. Don't say, oh, sorry, when you're on a bus, on a train, on a metro, and someone bumps into you, sorry. Don't smile overtly. This is a big one. If you've ever been to London, you see on the on the on the pavement on corners, uh, look right, look right, because that's where cars are coming from. Uh, Americans actually get killed in London for looking the wrong way, thinking that no cars are coming. They walk out in front of a car and it hits them. So don't look right when preparing to cross the street uh, with busy traffic. Keep your fork in your left hand. Elbows on the table. Sur la table are okay. Students who were scheduled to become wireless operators, WTs, went straight from boot camp to RA, at RA SAG up in Scotland, that real tough boot camp. They learned how to use knives. They learned how to shoot everything. They learned how to kill with one hand. Uh, just, just quite amazing. Then uh, they went to their own school. They were told upon landing, bury your radio, otherwise hide it. Hide the wireless set upon arrival. Also hide your parachute, etc. Camouflage the aerial, the antenna. Allowing the allowing it not to be seen if you have to go out. Stay with friends because hand keys and key taps are audible across walls. Constantly move and set and set your aerial. Constantly be on constantly on the move. Don't stay in one place. Restrict your times and your length of transmissions because the direction finders can get you. Wireless operators were never ever to be used for other work, but they were. The other there were three agents. You had the organizer, the courier and then the wireless operators. They also used others called cutouts, people that they would, who would help them to do this or that so that the organizer and the courier uh, would not be out in the open so much. But cutouts were never sent to wireless operators uh, to their place of operation. Establish a reserve means of communication if the wireless uh, operator must go into hiding. No messages via the wireless operator can be conven if they can be conveniently sent, sent by other means. Messages at the beginning were to be between 150 and 200 letters, and finally they figured that that was a big mistake because the longer that they were online or on the air, the easier it was for the direction finders to find them. One rule which was not followed at the beginning, and they learned, uh, and it was a bloody 
bloody lesson that they learned. No wireless operators were to communicate with other wireless operators in the field, in the theater, uh, because, because the, the security was just blown all to heck. There's a guy by the name of Lewis, that was his code name, in the OSS, the American, the Overseas Service, uh, in North Africa. He was caught, uh, went from North Africa to, to Southern France, he was caught. And so they wanted him to transmit. So they forced him, the Gestapo forced him to transmit. And how did he alert those copying his signals in, uh, in Algeria? How did they know that he had been caught? Uh, he transmitted SK, not VA, when he signed off. He, he, so, so that would be, he signed da-da-da-da-da instead of da-da-da-da-da. Well, the SK is the German way of signing off and the VA is the American way of signing off. And apparently the Germans never caught that first time that he did it. So the, so the OSS knew that he was sending bogus information for four months and he finally escaped. So going and then hopefully coming home. There were two airports that were used. One was at Thamesford Airfield north of London and the other was at Tangmere Airfield right down on the coast. And these are, Former one is a former picture, and then the right-hand one is present-day picture, two different uh, buildings. Once they were outward bound, they were called Joes or Janes or just Bods. And before shoving off, they would be uh, ha have a conducting officer, and they would not have any contact with anyone else. They were not allowed to, to talk to anyone. Uh, their clothing had to be exactly what French clothing would be. At one place in France, in northern France, the farmers and the local people didn't wear underwear. So if you were sent to that area, you better not have any underwear on. Um, they were given two eggs. Uh, food was very scarce, but they were given two eggs. There's one book called Two Eggs on My Plate, uh, written by one of these, uh, one of the uh, agents who survived and wrote a book about it years later. They had to use an eight-day period uh, when the moon was up because the airplanes that they used had to fly by dead reckoning using rivers, churches, mountains. This is the airplane. This one is in the Smithsonian, and it looks nice and pretty, but it certainly didn't look like that when they were using it. This is the uh, instrument panel on the, the one there uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Smithsonian. It had a Bristol Mercury engine, nine-cylinder rotary engine using octane gas, regular octane gas. It idled at 300 RPM, very slow and it cruised at 2700 rpm it was constant velocity as it were they had they had a variable pitch prop and then after that they they doused that and just used a regular old prop no armaments they added a 150 gallon belly a, a tank and later later on they made that permanent so that they could go all the way to southern france and come back these pilots were very good the the airplanes these airplanes these engines tended to uh maybe could, could catch fire right at the beginning when they were fired up they were very hard to keep going, uh, and because of the nature of the airplane and the tail wheel, it was not an easy airplane to turn around on a farmer's field. But these pilots were really, really good. 300 pilots actually lost their lives flying these things during the war. They had a very small radio. The flaps automatically extended and retracted. You, you didn't do anything there. But, but if you didn't know how to fly this plane off of the deck, off of the, off of the, uh, the airfield or the grass, you would die. You had to set everything perfectly. Here is one of those airplanes. You can see the um, ladder there. The ladder was in fact permanent and its rungs were painted silver so that it could be seen at night by those getting in the out and those getting in who were running from the woods up there to get in. And the, there was only one place for the pilot. No other person could sit next to the pilot. Uh, this is one of the airplanes. There are only four left in the, uh, left in the world today that are running, running I say two in Britain and two here, one in Ottawa, I think, and the other is at the uh, museum. You ought to go see it up at uh, Hamilton, uh, Ontario. It crashed a few years ago and they haven't put it back together. I'm waiting for it to be built so that I can go and fly in it. So let's take a look. I think uh, we have uh, uh, Scott who is going to pull up a movie for us. It's called School for Danger and you'll be able to see the whole movie on, uh, on YouTube, 1947. But I thought we would like to see just a little bit of it. It's from 45 minutes, 55 seconds to 49.02. Are you there, Scott? Yep, here we go. Well, what can I do for you? Can you bring a man out of France with me? 
Through Spain or Switzerland? I'm afraid that's no good. He's been wounded in the leg. Lysander pickup is the only way. Why do you come to me? Evidently you've got the latest dome. It's not too easy. There aren't many fields around here big enough for an aircraft to land in. Well, will you try? I'll do my best. I had a field for the pickup in mind and went along to have a look at it. I didn't feel too happy about receiving an aircraft. A couple of SS battalions had just moved into the local barracks and they were making reconnaissance sorties at night. I don't suppose they were after us, but we might have had some awkward questions to answer if they found us gathered around a Lysander in the middle of the night. The field was ideal surrounded by low-lying woods, perfect surface, and well concealed from the road. But the raft would need exact measurements, so I started walking down one side, counting my paces. Ted, have you seen this telegram? Felix wants a Lysander pickup. I was expecting this. I'll send him out a lieutenant on the same operation. He shows growing and he must have help. He sent a promising ground, and the Air Ministry are photographing it tomorrow. Oh, good. I was able to use the pilots as a postman. I sent London details of a local factory where parts of a new secret weapon were being stored. I asked them to stop the RAF from coming and bombing it. I wanted to have a crack at setting fire to it myself. Both Gustav and Leon were good types. It was always a risk when people came out from London. You never knew what you might get. That was a film done in 1947, and, and, and there were at least two actors who were real agents. We'll talk about that. Another airplane that was used was a Lockheed Hudson, and there was a Whitley bomber, and all kinds of airplanes were used. They would make a hole in the bottom of the center of the bomber, and, and the, uh, uh, the people would parachute, just parachute right out the hole. They had to learn to parachute, of course, before they did that. That was one of the boot camp uh, experiences that they had. So London Wireless, uh, evading the capture, thwarting the enemy, if you could. Uh, quickly now, let's get on here. These are the Fannies and the Wafts. Fanny was a nurse auxiliary from World War I, and they used that, that organization and just folded it right into the military for World War II. They really, really did not have military status. Uh, one of the shortcomings of, of the war for people. And the WAFs were the Women's Air Corps. They worked both for the SOE and for the Y stations, the listening stations for Bletchley Park, first aid and yeomanry stations at Grendon Underwood and at Poundon. Women who were, just to let you know here, for, for, for the Enigma uh, and uh, the, the Ultra operation at Bletchley Park, uh, they would usually uh, bring in women who from the local area where there was a radio state receiving station. So there were there were hundreds of women who did this all over uh, all over Great Britain and never talked after the war. They all had to sign the Official Secrets Act. Y stations. Y stations was called Y short for wireless. This is one of the only pictures that I know of that has a, a woman who's sitting here in front of, of a national HRO. Probably this comes from, from Bletchley Park. You can see the, uh, the coil 
the, the coil inserts there in the boxes to her right for the different frequencies. So you have you have uh, a, a, a great picture here. Later, the the OSS used uh, both HROs, but they used a lot of helicrafters SX28. There was the special OSS transmitting and receiving station west of London in the little village of Hurley, H-U-R-L-E-Y, and a book has just come out about that station called Victor. You'll see it at the end, its information at the end of my presentation tonight. 10,000 of the HROs were, were, were transferred to, to the British during the war. Here is uh, one of the two transmitter receiver antenna sites for the SOE. This is Pounding Station 53B. They're very close to each other. Notice how expansive the antenna system was. It was 125 acres, 50 transmitters. They had one for long haul uh, down to Yugoslavia and even into the Far East. They had a, a, a seven high gain rhombics uh, for eight to 10 dB gain. The radio operators were housed and camouflaged in an off-site for security. Everything was controlled remotely. This all comes from a book by uh, P. Laurent or Lorraine Clandestine Operations, originally in French and now in English. You can find that book uh, through Amazon.com, a used book, and get a hold of it. It's very informative. Hey, also from this book, it tells how, how the, uh, the enemy was doing direction finding. First, they would on the top left, they would listen for a signal uh, from different parts of Germany or from Brest up in uh, northwestern France, and they would send this by underground cable. At the beginning of the war, it was underground cable. It did not go on radio. They would they would do a teletype, and within s minutes or maybe even seconds, send their information to Germany, uh, tell where it was. Uh, then it would be sent back to the local area, and then they would go to the to the to the right here, top right. They would do another triangulation and get it close in to that other smaller triangle. That other small triangle becomes part of a town and part of a town in the lower left. They would find out where the neighborhood was and then they would go in with DF trucks or they would have a person walking the streets uh, with, with uh, a radio under listening uh, with earphones on and a fedora hat probably over his earphones. But, but the French found out quickly that there was somebody in the neighborhood because they would see these funny guys walking around with these puffy black coats, something under their coat. But then they could almost, they could, they could identify the place. That happened many times. But also people were, were betrayed. So there were many ways in which a radio operator could die. The Gestapo, the security service, and the Abwehr were three, three units. And they, they, as we say, happen in Britain too. It happens in America, it happens in every, every national military set of organizations where they uh, compete against each other to win the same war. The Abwehr was the internal, like the like our present FBI, but uh, not really like it, but that was a military intelligence in country, but it was used also in France under Vice Admiral Canaris. Uh, it depended on who caught you, but usually you were turned over to the Gestapo and your end was, uh, uh, was almost certain. Uh, Joseph Kiefer, was was the head of the S, he was SS and then also SD, uh, senior intelligence officer in Paris. He was finally uh, caught and uh, interrogated, uh, put on trial and put to death. But not Hugo Bleicher. Uh, he was a wily character. He would uh, go up to people and say, you know, I, I want to I want to defect. I want to go to London. I want to defect. And 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 sometimes gullible agents would fall for it. Here's an up there radio listening post. So the British and the Americans, by the way, on the other hand, had their own programs and methods to catch Nazi agents in country. And both, both in Britain and in America, were highly successful. At this point, I'll tell you that, uh, that very few agents in, uh, came to America and were successful. But there was one man by the name of Walter Kuhler who came to the America. He came to America. He walked up to uh, uh, the people at the at the dock and said, "I am I am an agent. <laughs> I am a German agent, but I want to be a double agent." So they put him up in a hotel in New York City, and uh, and they doubled him. So in other words, he was doubled. And they set up a radio out on Long Island, and they sent messages to Germany all the time. And uh, and uh, the FBI loved it. Herbert Hoover loved it. He, you know, we have this. We have these people. Uh, dead to rights. 
and uh, and the Germans were saying this is great information. Although Kurler was supposed to be sending information about the bomb, about something that, and he never did. But they were continuing to say yes. Only after the war did they find out uh, by interrogating other Germans at the listening post in out of Hamburg that in fact there was a a second agent. So in fact, Walter Kurler was a triple agent, and uh, he was giving information to a man who would come into New York City every week. The man would drive back home and get on his clandestine radio and send it off to Germany. And it was never, ever found. Whatever he sent was not important uh, by the end of the war. Nothing could have been that important to change the war at all. As it turns out, that wireless operator who was working with Walter Kuhler, Walter Kuhler, was doing it all from Rochester, New York. And to this day, nobody knows who he was. Uh, you had the British 20 system. You can see it's a double cross system where they would get people to turn against, to turn and to go back into Germany uh, or to work for them in England. Counter espionage under MI5. Uh, at one point, they tried to figure out if they could figure out who, if people were really the real wireless operator or a fake wireless operator. German wireless operators and even, even British were very good at, at learning another wireless operator's fist uh, and, and, and how they sent it. So they, someone worked out this device. Uh, so you can see two different wireless operators here, the ABC at the top and the ABC from the middle to the bottom. And the A is different, the B is different, the C is different. So it's almost pre-computerized uh, figuring out, making a fingerprint as it were, of a wireless operator's hand but it didn't work very well. They, they, they didn't really use it. Uh, it was too cumbersome. So those who serve. Now let's, we're on to our home stretch here. Uh, the agents, the, uh, the F section agents, uh, this, were, this was the British, uh, run by the British, run by the SOE, not run by de Gaulle. De Gaulle's group was called the RF group. They, they worked together, but they competed. They were in the same cities together, not even knowing that the others were there. De Gaulle and his group had to use uh, the airplanes, the British airplanes. Uh, they had to use everything the Brits gave them. They didn't have anything. They didn't have radios or anything. All of them came from, from the British. And uh, But De Gaulle just, let's say this, it galled him, no end. And uh, it is said that at one point when he went back to Bordeaux after D-Day, when the Germans had been been routed out, uh, he saw uh, maybe a thousand men, resistance men, marching down the street behind an SOE man, and he knew him. And he walked up to him and punched him in the in the in the in, in the chest and said, "I want you out of here. You are unwelcome. I want you out of here by nightfall." So, if you go to France today and go to the to the museum there in Paris, or to the museum. In Paris, another smaller museum to the honor of, of Jean Moulin, M-O-U-L-I-N, a famous agent who died a horrendous death, uh, but was a famous, turned out to be a hero for France. He has a whole museum to him, and there are radios in there. Uh, you will not find hardly anything about the SOE. Uh, as far as de Gaulle was concerned, it was the French who did all the work. So after the war, you have these little arguments, don't you? Um, and, and the French, uh, many French are not very informed about that, except that there was a, a television program in the year 2004 to the effect that, hey, guys, from France, hey, guys, there was a group called the SOE that did a lot of this. 480 were, at least were inserted, 130 were captured, 26 survived. Of those 480, 72 were women, 75 were women. Uh, of course, many were sent to the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, rest of France. 39 trained at schools who were deployed. And uh, you had 29 of these women were captured by the enemy and almost none of them came back. 16 were executed. One died in Paris of illness and one took cyanide. There was a first woman, but she was not French. She was not, uh, uh, she was not British. She was an American. Her name was Virginia Hall. She found herself in Lyon, France, south central France, as a as a journalist. 
and, the, and America had not entered the war, so she could stay there all this time. She had a limp because she had shot herself in the leg when she was in Turkey years before. Having, she was working for the, uh, for the State Department at the time, and uh, that was the end of her State Department uh, uh, career. Uh, they would never make her an agent uh, uh, or a State Department uh, operative. But she was very important, and she became the fixer. She was the big fixer in South Central France for everybody. She had a limp. She had a limp. The first agent inserted was Georges Piggy. There he is. Look how young he is. He went to the University of Hull, England in engineering, and he was good in Morse code. He parachuted blind into South Central France to an area that is today uh, is, is the area where there is a big, big monument to all of the French resistance who died, who, who operated, who died. He had he was he was dropped miles off course and had to lug that big that big heavy radio and his all of his clothes miles and miles. Nobody thought that he was a, he was an agent, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it was this was in the Vichy area in the non-occupied zone, so there were no German soldiers around at the time, but the Vichy police were. And he couldn't get information back fast enough, so he came up with the idea of having personal messages from the BBC. He was the one who said, use the BBC to send messages to resistance groups. He was doing, he was, wire, he was sending wireless three times per day. Can you imagine? They stopped that. Here's Virginia Hall. Um, she was a former U.S. State Department employee, but then a reporter. Then she worked for the SOE. When the, when the Germans moved into southern France after the uh, Operation Torch, uh, that is to say the American and British incursion into North Africa, Hitler moved into southern France and took over the Vichy area as well, and everybody had to run for their lives. She had to escape. Now, there's a woman with a wooden leg. Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon, the, uh, the SS butcher of Lyon was looking for her. The woman with the limp, they had pictures of her out, but they were not very good pictures. They never caught her. She went over the Pyrenees, those very rugged mountains on the border of France and Spain with that leg. This picture on the right is a, uh, a painting of her in the early 2000s. It hangs now in the CIA. You cannot see her right leg because that was the one that was a wooden leg. And she's using a B2 spy radio there. Best book about, about uh, Virginia Hall is a book by Sonia Purnell, A Woman of No Importance. It's on the, uh, it's on the, on the bibliography. I'm going to go through just a few of the people here. Not everybody's a wireless operator. I can't give that much of a representative cut of everybody, but these are some, I think, who, who, who stood out. Uh, you actually had a very interesting young woman here. She was a cyclist, a mountain climber, a very, very interesting person. She worked, uh, she worked at a pastry shop in Paris. Uh, she was in Spain and fought uh, on the Republican side against the Francos. She worked for the Red Cross, then, then the underground. Perpignan is a town uh, right on the border. It's on the Mediterranean, on the border between Spain and France. And uh, she then began to work with MI9 uh, on the PAT line. They were called lines. These were groups, and there were several of them. Lines to get downed pilots and other people who needed to get out, away from the enemy to get them out of, of France. And so they sent them over the Pyrenees. Uh, she really learned security. She learned what security was, that you kept your mouth shut, that you didn't hang around with your friends all the time with all the other agents, that you didn't go out and play cards with them at some bar at night. So she came back to France. She came back to England through, through, the, through her own pat line. And uh, she went and she, she went to, uh, to de Gaulle's group and said, I want to work for the free, for you free French forces. De Gaulle said, no. If you've worked for the Brits, you're tainted. You can't work for us. So she landed with the SOE. She, she, she was one of the first women into France uh, to parachute in September 24th, 1942. Although the SOE began activities in the middle of 1941, but they were ham-handed for a, almost a whole year until they learned the trade, learned the trade craft. She hooked up with Francis Suttil, uh, who was the head of the Prosper Group. You can see it at the top of the uh, the picture here, a physician and prosper. Each one of the units, each one of the groups of three handled an area of France and they were given names. 
the names of the first names were basically professions. One was called Prosper, which was not that, but it was originally called Physician. It got so big that uh, that it actually came to the attention of the uh, Gestapo. But he said once that she is the best of us. Uh, she's a real a real person. She uh, was second in command on one attack, which she was. Uh, she was not a, a wireless operator. She was only a courier, and uh, a, a an attack, a surprise attack on some some uh, train yard or on a power station. That's what's called coup de main, uh, or a, a surprise attack. She was caught. Went to Fren Prison. It's called. It's pronounced Fren. We say Fresnes. No, it's Fren Prison outside of that terrible prison, uh, uh, Gestapo prison outside of Paris. And uh, on July 6, 44, she 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 was uh, she went to her death. Izzy Newman, a good Jewish boy. You need to know that there was a very lively, very close knit a cell, large cell, uh, and many different cells of Jews who had to go underground and who made their own their own uh, sabotage and information gathering units. And they also were very, they had their own line to the Pyrenees where they would spirit people out. So he was a good catch for any Jewish girl, his mom would, would say. He went to wireless training school and he did really excellent work as an instructor to other students. He was a very nice guy. He was one of Buckmaster's best operators in France. He went into he went at Gibraltar, island of Gibraltar, and then on a nine-day submarine trip. Uh, they didn't do this very much, only at the beginning. And then he was let off on the southern coast of France, on the uh, down by Marseille. There was a a, a a réseau or a circuit of 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 people who had started up themselves, not from the SOE, and it was called CART. It was so large and so unmanageable that it was blown, and uh, almost all the cart people were were uh, were caught. But he sent 200 messages uh, through Peter Churchill, no relation to Winston, down at Cannes, and then later from Rouen he sent 54 messages. He was betrayed, captured, and murdered at Mauthausen, which was just outside of Linz in Austria. He was extremely security minded, never transmitted from the same place twice, cycled many times every month, often riding 40 miles outside of Rouen to transmit, even though the area was, was chock a block full of the enemy. He was also worked with a salesman, Rizzo, and they destroyed a 900 ton minesweeper at Rouen. They destroyed an aluminum factory, large electrical supplies dump, troop training derailments, intelligence gathering at Le Havre in northern France. Of Eileen and Jackie Nairn, uh, I am happy to tell you that both of these women survived the war. They had a brother, Francis. They all three worked as agents for SOE. They had no idea that their two siblings were working for SOE as well. Jackie's on the left. She was a courier and a wireless operator. Uh, she used the Paris trains all the time. She carried around spare radio parts and a cosmetics bag. Which makes me wonder, you know, to what extent did they have certain radio operators who did know how to repair radios? I know that I know of one guy who did. She returned home after the war. She cared for her sister, who's there on the right. Then she came to the New York City and worked for the United Nations for the, the British Protocol Unit. Eileen, also wireless operator, sent 105 messages. She organized finances. Uh, she was there active for five months. She was one who who transmitted V1 rocket information about the V1 rocket launching sites in northern France. She was detected by a DF a group. She was tortured and sent to this very horrible women's prison uh, about 100 miles northwest of uh, Berlin called Ravensbrück. If you st keep reading or start reading about the SOE, you're going to find this word returning many times. Many women died in Ravensbrück, and not just SOE, but, but women who had been in the resistance in France, uh, all kinds of women, even from Germany, who were the unwanted kinds. She was sent to Torgau 
Torgau is in southeastern Germany, and nobody's been there, but I can tell you it was very important in the Reformation. <laughs> Martin Luther, very important. It is a beautiful, today a beautiful, beautiful castle. She was put in the castle and in other areas, the castle at one point, uh, as a prison, and she was sent there to work. She escaped. This is at the very, very end of the war in March, April, May. She went, she slogged through snow and she was emaciated and she made it all the way west to Leipzig. Take a look on the map where Torgau is and where Leipzig is. At the end of the war, she was hiding in a bell tower, church bell tower there in Leipzig and someone noticed her and was going to shoot her down thinking that she was uh, a German up there who was uh, still trying to resist. But they brought her down and found out she had escaped all the way. I've been in this area and she had to go. It's flat ground, but boy, did she have to go a long way. He was uh, well known. Her name was Didi. And then later on, her name was forgotten. And uh, she lived penniless uh, and died in the town of Torquay, T-O-R-Q-U-A-Y, on the coast of the, of, of, of the English Channel. And when they went in, uh, and they sent a social worker in. They found her dead body. She was very old. And there she is down there, uh, um, the two women there. And uh, she had all of these medals, all of these medals for her war effort. And so the entire town and the whole region turned out and gave her a great burial, a great send off. This is an amazing story of these two women. Here is Jackie, the real Jackie who is in that movie that you just, part of which you saw, and here she's at a real radio, not the one that we have, but they would take the radio apart out of its suitcase and then have it in front of them. And she is the one who is actually, she was, she was a wireless operator and she is doing the movie part. Uh, another woman who was a wireless operator, uh, she, she flaunted the rules. Go down about two thirds of the way through my white area there for six months. She lived in one village in southwest France. There was no water. There was no electricity. It was in the middle of nowhere. And she transmitted same antenna, same house, same room for six months. <laughs> and the Germans never used a direction finder, never found her. And they never looked in that area because first, there was no electricity there and no running water. And they they concluded, what, 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 what? British person or what French woman, if it's a woman, what a British woman would ever go to a place where you couldn't buy lipstick? <clears throat> so they never looked. He was the second uh, wireless operator sent into France, woman operator. Uh, at the end of the war, after D-Day, she helped dislodge an army group, the army group G, the huge army group G from Toulouse. And in the process, she was shot in the leg by a German patrol. If you'd like to see the dress she was wearing, at the time, it still has blood stain on it. It is in the uh, British Museum at Kews, K E W S, uh, at the British Military Museum in, Lo in, in London. At one point, uh, she was stopped and she was asked to tell what she had there in the suitcase. She said it's an x ray machine and she was so good at explaining it. She sent over 400 messages in 12 months. Uh, Francis Commerts, very smart guy. Uh, his father was a professor in England, and his father was there from Belgium, and he translated G.K. Chesterton's Father Brown mystery series into uh, French before the war, of course. He was very good at Cambridge University. He was a hockey star, and he, he was a teacher. He taught it. He was in education. He taught in Belfast and London. He was a close friend of Harry Ree, who was also in the SOE. You'll see him in a minute. He was very security-minded, and he was a conscientious objector. But he went anyway because his brother had, had died in the RAF, in the RAF. And so he noticed that there was a huge problem between the SOE, the F people in France, and uh, de Gaulle's. He had visited Vercors and the Maquisards there, that is to say those resistance fighters who had uh, collected in the forests and whatnot. Vercors is one of the two famous places, famous if you might call it that, where there were big gun battles with the Germans, where the Maquisards lost. One is at Vercours in south central France and the other is in the, uh, in the high Savoy up in the French Alps at a place called Glière. I've been there and uh, they, were, they were cornered. Their mistake was that they did not know 
they were not really trained either as a regular military group or even as as guerrillas. They stood their ground, and in standing their ground, the the, the Germans came in uh, uh, with with air attacks and uh, dropped soldiers in on parachutes and killed many of them. There is a very famous um, a, a cemetery in the mountains there to all those 50 men who died there. 50 of those men who died were Spaniards. They had come up to fight. Uh, they had been fighting in the, with the uh, Republicans against uh, Franco during 1937-38. He was arrested by the Gestapo, but he was saved by Christine Granville on a bluff. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, after the war, he became a teacher, headmaster at the University of Plymouth. Then he went off to Kenya and Botswana, was quite an educator. Uh, he is, uh, you know, quite a person. Here's Harry Reid, almost a parallel uh, life. He was a teacher. He had also been a conscientious objector. He went to France in 43, and he was, he was, a, he was, these people were not radio guys. They were not couriers. They were the organizers. They were the ones who developed what sabotage should happen. They were the ones who handed out the guns. They were the ones who organized the resistance groups. And so at one point, the British were going to bomb the Peugeot factory. It was making aircraft parts and tank turrets at Sochaux. Sochaux is close to a place called Malabrian, over uh, uh, just north of Switzerland, in a little pocket between France and Germany. And uh, they were uh, these people were well off in this in this area, the Peugeot factory, and so they were going to bomb it. And Harry knew that, and he so he he radioed back to France to England and said, "Please don't do that. We will destroy it ourselves." So he went to the Mr. Peugeot and he said, "Look, uh, we don't want to kill everybody in this small town. Uh, we want simply to put you out of business for a while." And of course, Peugeot was not against that we can do a surgical strike here. So they, they did a surgical strike with workers inside the factory and they blew up the major equipment, which put that factory out of business and the RAF did not bomb the town. He, he, he did not want people to die. He was shot four times, he had to swim his way out and he had to, to escape not far away, escape to Switzerland. After the war, he became professor at the University of York his son, by the way, is Jonathan Ree, a well-known philosopher. And his picture, you saw him in the movie. He is Henri in the School for Danger. He is, he is the other one. He's, he's the, actually the, the organizer in that. Here's a woman who had quite, has quite a past. Her name is Christina Scarbeck, but she didn't call herself that. That was a real name. She called herself Christine Granville. She was Polish. She had Jewish background. Many, many, many people in Europe, which means many people in America have Jewish background and don't know it. She was born in Warsaw, a Polish noble family. Father was Catholic, but her mother was Jewish. Uh, the family had a Chopin connection somewhere. She escaped after the uh, Nazis moved into, into, into Poland in 39. She escaped over the Tatra Mountains southward to deliver intelligence. And she finally made her way through Hungary and to Cairo and from there back to London. Uh, she went to the SOE schools and was inserted back, not from north, from London, but from Algiers on July 6th of 44. What a date, July 6th, 1944. She was very, very active. Vera Atkins, remember Vera Atkins, who was that powerful woman at the home office of SOE, said she was a very brave woman, but she also was a law unto herself and she was a loner. She probably, probably, it's not certain, became one of Ian Fleming's uh, characters in the in the book Vesper Lind. By the way, Fleming was worked for the naval for naval intelligence, and uh, he got wind of all this stuff that was going on. So a lot of his James Bond stories were were, were taken from naval intelligence and from the SOE. She was Vesper Lind, maybe in Casino Royale. So at the very end of the war, she was down at the area between France and Italy. She heard that her very good friend Kamarts, what had been had been captured by the uh, by the Gestapo. So what did she do? This is the woman who thinks for herself. She marches up to the to the encampment where he is pris imprisoned. She she marches into the Gestapo officer's office and says, "You know, 
you're going to lose this war. You're going to have to get out of here. You're going to have to flee. So I've got a deal for you. You give me uh, Kamarts and I'll let you go. <laughs> and she succeeded. <laughs> she also went to the Col de l'Arche. It's a pass in the mountains between France and Italy called the Madeleine Pass. And um, in France, it's called Col de l'Arche. Uh, there were as a group of Polish soldiers who had fought for the Nazis the whole war. And there were also Germans there. And she walked up to them. She said, I want you to change sides. So she talked to the Polish soldiers. I want you to change sides and come over to us. And they did. By the way, she succeeded with Kamarts with that SS officer because she said, I am Monty Montgomery's niece. And you're going to be in really big trouble if you don't let this man go with me. This is a group of Makisards in the Haute Alps, in the High Alps, France. They had, they had their guns and whatnot, but only because of these drops from parachute. Here are some parachute drops in those long, long tanks. You can see a couple of those tanks, by the way, in the museum in Paris. One of the tanks, in one of the tanks in the museum in Paris, has a bike, has a motorbike that is all folded up. It wasn't used very much because it was so loud and you couldn't get gasoline for it. You have explosives in a pod. These were not dropped. These were parachuted. Radios were not parachuted in these containers. They were parachuted in what were called packages. And the packages were uh, also uh, par parachuted out. But the packages were about three and a half feet by three and a half feet. They would bounce a little bit. Vera Rolf, a, 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 an operator, her, uh, her father was a chartered accountant in Paris. She had rheumatic fever at 17 didn't know what to do. So uh, the family was in Brazil at the time. She learned to swim, to dance, and first aid in Morse code. And she worked for the British Embassy after that. And in 43, she found herself back in, uh, in 41, of course, but in 43, she joined the WAF and she parachuted into Orléans in central France in April 5th of 44, just before D-Day. And she was on missions. At that time, you even had you know, uh, operators who were not simply doing wireless operation, but they were also going out to shoot. Uh, in a gun battle and while transmitting, she was caught July 31st. She was tortured, executed at Ravensbrück, together with Violette Sabot, Denise Bloch, Cecile Lefort. Odette Sanson lived. She survived. Unbelievable story. You'll see her picture in a moment. Her Morse code skills were quite good. She knew Morse and trained for approximately six weeks. So the guy said, I was surprised when I started to teach her this. I was surprised present, presented with a group of newly recruited WAFs. And she, this one girl had all these abilities, but I never knew her name. Here is uh, Violetta Sabot. Sabot, what a name. That's her husband's name, Sabot there. And her name was Bushell. She came from Eastern London and had a real Cockney accent but she spoke French. She was a tomboy. She did long distance bicycling, shooting, gymnastics. Uh, childhood years were spent in France. And she worked at Woolworths in Oxford Street and the Bon Marché. Uh, she had a 42 day romance. He was 31 and she was 19, but he was killed at the Battle of El Alamein. There he is. She learned Morse code and cipher and became an SOE operative. So April 6th, she dropped into Le Havre and went to Rouen. She came back and then was inserted a second time to Limoges, but she was caught in a Citroen car she was driving down the road and they should not have been driving down the road. And the guy driving her, a Frenchman said, oh, we have no problem. They won't, there are no, this was, this was after, after D-Day and the Germans were everywhere. No, we will not have a problem. She ran right into some Germans. She ran out, she got out of the car firing her Sten gun uh, ran into the woods and uh, she was uh, she was hit and so she told into into a field and she told a wheat field I think and she told uh, the other guy you keep running uh, I'll 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 hold him off well she was sent to Robinsbrook and uh, she was murdered there so you'll see her at the very end uh, at her statue at the very end of tonight. A book was written by her and a film that came out called Carve Her Name with Pride, a 1958 film. So she has to learn her uh, her poem. Early on, she has to learn 
a secret poem. And uh, she says, I just can't, I just can't get it. I can't get it. Of course, she's speaking in French and of course in English to, uh, to Leo Marx, who trains everybody at the very end in their, can they do their enciphering and deciphering well? So he said, I opened the door of the briefing room, a dark haired slip of a mischief rose from behind the desk and held out her hand and smiled. She had a Cockney accent, which added to her impishness. It seemed inappropriate for the head of codes, Leo Marx for me, to mark the occasion by singing, every little breeze seems to whisper Louise, because that was her code name. So I shook her hand in silence. Professor Iggins instructed Eliza Doolittle to encode a walk message at least 200 letters long. It won't come out, it won't come out. She said, why do I keep making mistakes? So apparently she's speaking English and German at the same time. So she thumps her head, she says, pourquoi, why, why, why? Do you know a poem you'd like me to try? So in other words, without a walk, uh, not having, not being able to do the transposition using the walk, the silk, the silk paper, he said, she said, can you give me a, a poem? He said, okay. So this is the poem he gave. This was a poem he had written for a woman he had fallen in love with, whose name was Ruth, who had been sent to Canada, probably to Station X, which was a first an SOE station in Canada and then an OSS station in Canada to train the OSS. And uh, she died in an airplane crash. That was a big, big hit for him. He still had the poem. Probably Ruth was on her way to Camp X, which is just on the outskirts of Toronto today. So th this is a poem. This poem has become very famous in England. The life that I have is all that I have and the life that I have is yours. The love that I have of the life that I have is yours and yours and yours. And sleep I shall have, a rest I shall have, yet death will be but a pause for the peace of my years. And the long green grass will be yours and yours and yours. It's not without accident that uh, Leo Marx, after the war, became a playwright. He said, I also learned that she was the deadliest shot in the training school. If you'd like to uh, listen to Maurice Chevalier singing Louise, every little breeze seems to whisper Louise, you can go online to YouTube and look up Maurice Chevalier and Louise. By the way, Maurice Chevalier lived and stayed in the uh, the unoccupied zone in southwest France, close to Bordeaux. And after the war, he was charged with being a collaborator with the Vichy regime. And of course, he said, absolutely not. I was not at all. So there's a, a little side story on that. Here is uh, Harry Poulevy, a wireless operator. He broke his leg uh, the first time uh, south uh, by Nîmes, uh, France, broke his leg and had to make his way ac across the Pyrenees with a half broken leg and get back. And the second time he was inserted into the Corrège, which is also Southwest, to the, to the France Tireur. Uh, these were another a resistance group, an, uh, an independence resistance group. And he was captured in August of 44. On his way to prison, he met on a train, Violetta Sabot, and uh, she, he, she gave him some water. It's just amazing. Or maybe I'm mixing this up with uh, Noor Eniat Khan. Uh, there are so many people to remember. He was sent to Buchenwald and almost everybody was murdered at Buchenwald. Buchenwald is close to Weimar, Germany, about 150 miles southwest of Berlin, kind of close to the northern Bohemian uh, Czechoslovak border. But by a ruse, he escaped. Only seven escaped. He escaped with Yeo Thomas, an America, a British guy, the only real British guy that de Gaulle ever liked. And he, they both uh, escaped and uh, made their way back to the American front uh, as it was moving across in April, late April of 45. So we're coming to the end now. We have Peter Churchill and we're jumping to the beginning of the whole effort. He goes in 1942 to southern France on a felucca, a, a boat out of Gibraltar to the, to the Riviera area. And uh, he tries to clean up what's going on down there. Everybody's kind of like Keystone cops and he has to clear out. He evaluated this group called CART, C-A-R-T-E. 
His French courier was Odette Sanson, not Samson, but Sanson, S-A-N-S-O-M. And uh, they had to hightail it out of the area around Marseille and Cannes. And so they went to a place called Annecy, A-N-N-E-C-Y. I know the area well. They stayed in a, in a hotel at saint Jorio. They had a radio operator, you will see in a, in a moment, his picture, uh, who, who was up in the mountains. And it worked for a while. But Hugo Bleicher, the man whose picture you saw, the up there man who was trying to catch these people, Hi, I want to go to England and, and become a British and work against the Germans. He fooled a lot of people. There were people who turned uh, uh, information, and they were all found out. In the meantime, he had flown, Churchill had flown back to London for just a couple of days and had come back and landed on a mountain very close to where we were living. Uh, you'll see this in just a moment. The next morning, he was lying in his bed, and he was caught by Bleicher. And... Uh, Sanson Odette said, we're married. We're married. They weren't. Uh, we're married. And he is a relative of Churchill. They were able to fool him about him and her for the whole time. So he was, uh, Peter Churchill was put into different prison camps to Dachau. And then at the end of the war, he was sent on this with this group of prisoners, famous people, into the Alps, down toward Italy. And the SS had orders to shoot them all at the very end. It didn't happen. And all of these people, all of these people were saved. She was sent to Ravensbrück and she told the commandant at Ravensbrück at the very end, put me in your car and uh, I'll take, because he had saved her back on this, on the hope this would happen. Put me in your car and we will go to the American front. You'll live. So that happened. So she survived as well. And uh, in fact, when she got to the American front, uh, she said, uh, arrest this man. He's the, he's the commandant of Ravensbrück Prison. <laughs> so don't mess with this woman. This is Odette Sanson. Uh, she survived the war. She was the first woman to be awarded the George Cross. The George Cross was created during World War II as, a, as, a, as, a, as, an, an, as an order or an honor for uh, common people who had uh, done uh, outstanding feats. She was born in France, blinded for three and a half years, polio, difficult convent school child, uh, thought for herself. She had three children in England. She joined, the, she joined the SOE based on a postcard. She's impulsive and hasty, people said. She lost a list of 200 people on the train. And this probably was a list that the Germans picked up and where they could clean up a lot of these groups. She escaped to Annecy. She was captured on April 15th of 43. But before that happened, they were able to send a number of messages through their wireless operator to Britain to get a lot of arms, guns and whatnot, down into that area that served the French resistance very well after D-Day. She married Peter Churchill at the end of the war. And of course, the, the marriage didn't last that long. He saw, he saw a good thing when he saw it. So he wrote three books. I have all three of them. He threw out three little paperback books about himself and about her. And uh, that made for a, a lot of uh, eyebrows. Here is uh, Alex Rabinovich. Um, he came from, he was Jewish, uh, grew up in, in Cairo, and uh, Russian Jewish parents who educated in Paris. He was a he was a fighter. He was a boxer. He was a tough guy. He was a giant fellow. He was a giant guy, and uh, you didn't mess around with him. He had a very good nose on him, and he said, "We've got to get out of here. These th there's some there's this play thing is fishy. Somebody's trying to catch us." They got caught. He did not, but he went back. He escaped over the Pyrenees, came back, and was betrayed right upon landing uh, in the field at night in northern, Fran in northern France. He, pulled, he whipped out his gun and started shooting. <laughs> but he was, he was uh, murdered at the concentration camp in Gros Rosen, August to September of 44. Difficult guy, but devoted and heroic. Here is where uh, Odette Sanson and Peter Churchill were uh, caught the morning at a hotel. Uh, at Saint-Joriot, J-O-R-I-O-Z, Saint-Joriot. 
um, across the river or down the river from the, t the larger town of Annecy. This whole area was controlled by the, uh, by the Italian army at the time. Here is what it looks like today. It's now an apartment house. I took this picture about three years ago. You can see the mountains to the east in the background there, going into the French Alps. And here are the Alps. They found a place for Alex, uh, the wireless operator, Alex Rabinovich. Uh, his name was really Adolf, but he called himself Alex, uh, to operate, and that the direction finders wouldn't, wouldn't find them or wouldn't even care about them uh, because he's transmitting in midst of mountains. So let's be up on that mountain that you just saw and look northwest right in the direction of London. And he was down at this little village, Les Tissot, which is about, he had to come up on a bicycle all the way up from the lake. See the lake there in the great distance in the, you can see it, just barely see the lake there. Very strong guy, he had two radios. He had one radio that he hid in that apartment house or in that hotel. And he came back after his two other uh, uh, compatriots were taken prisoner. And he found his radio, his extra uh, other radio, and he found almost a million francs that they had. All uh, operators, operatives were sent out with a lot of money. And this is the house that he sent from. It was the forester's house. Uh, what you see on the front of it right now is the is a new addition that is a, a, a nice garage. I've seen the inside of the garage, but I haven't seen the inside of the house. There is a plaque to, the, to your right on the side of the hill uh, saying that this was an, a place where the SOE was, the stone house. So the forester, uh, the forestry uh, man, was obviously in the French resistance. This is what the mountain looked like behind him. He would come around. He would come around the uh, on the bicycle to that to that uh, castle there uh, on the lake. Uh, the last picture is really uh, Phyllis Latour, uh, who at the very end of the war was uh, dropped into northern France by just before D-Day. She was searched one day by the by the by the Gestapo, by the by the by the police, and they didn't find the, her her walk her 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 silk. Uh, code as uh, she had it wound in her hair. These are pictures of the area where she was at, uh, Luc sur Mer, Juno Beach. This is pictures from my from my mother-in-law's uh, collection, and uh, they never did ask her uh, because the British were always asking about pictures of what the coastline would look like in preparation for D-Day. Uh, so that's in our family collection. Here she is. She's. Uh, we think she's still alive. This was in 2017 when she was given an honor. Uh, living in, in Auckland, New Zealand. So at the very end here, we have on the left-hand side on the uh, Albert Embankment across from uh, the river, the Thames River from Parliament. Uh, uh, that's a bust of uh, Sabo, uh, Violetta Sabo, uh, for all of the those who died. And the one on the right is the French one at Valencia in France. And each year they still have a commemorative event. Here is the uh, additional bibliography. So if you get to use this and go back online on the Ra Ra website and see all this, these are extra books that I do not have on my original bibliography. One at the bottom, Christopher Murphy is very interesting, Origins of the SOE, where he talks about all the brouhaha. People were very upset in 1951, 52, when they found out in England that they had parachuted women, of all things women, by night into France. Um, so. By 1966, they had to, uh, the book by, by M.R.D. Foote came out. You should read the book by William Stevenson, the second one up there, A Man Called Intrepid. You really need to read that book. That's about America as well. So please come visit the Antique Wireless Museum in Bloomfield, but you have to, uh, during COVID, you have to sign up for it by going online. Our usual hours are Tuesdays and Saturdays, but you have to go online to find out just what days we really are open. We don't have that airplane, but we have the B2 spy radio. Thank you very much, everybody, for spending all this time.